All right, good evening and salam perjuangan everyone. We have joined today on the online forum entitled Remembering Lim Chin Chong and the Socialist Wave in Malaya and Singapore in the 1950s and 60s, organized by Party Socialist Malaysia, aka PSM. Right, uh, today's forum will depart from the point of remembering or reminiscing uh, Lim Chin Chong and shall land in the discussion <coughs> that delve as microscopic as possible in dissecting the contribution of uh, Lim Chin Chong in being one of the crucial component of triggering or inflaming uh, the socialist wave in Malaya and Singapore between the uh, 1950s and 1960s. Right, undoubtedly, right, uh, Lim Chin Chong's oratory skills were phenomenal. Right, his prolific nature in delivering complex issues in layman terms, especially in connecting with the working class Chinese, it was one of the uh, pillars to his enormous popularity among, among the working class population within the trade union organization as well, as, well as the masses. Right. Uh, this might be also a plausible reason for becoming one of the youngest MP at the age of just 22. Right. Uh, however, right, this shall not mean uh, his linguistic skills were confined to Chinese alone or whatever dialects within the Chinese uh, language. At one point, I believe uh, later our panelists will also uh, unearth this information in much detail, right? That Lim Chin Xiong has written numerous art articles for Otosan Muda, another arm of Otosan Malaysia, which uh, the late Said Zahari has been the uh, editor as well, right? Uh, nevertheless, scholarly articles or critical scrutiny of Lim Chin Xiong remains a dart in the history books or the world of academia. Most of the pieces about uh, Lim Chin Chiong are either in the form of tribute or nostalgic anecdotes that reveal very little about, man, about the man. Right, so to enlighten us more about the decade in which Lim Chin Chiong has been extremely active in both intellectual discussions and working class politics. Right, so we have today two excellent speakers. Right, One is uh, Dr. Po Su Kai and Dr. P.J. Tham. Uh, to shed lights on the life and lessons of uh, that we could extract from uh, Lim Chin Siong. Right. So to briefly introduce our panelists today, right, Dr. Po Suka is a close comrade of Lim Chin Siong and amongst the founding members of Barisan Socialists. He has served in Barisan Socialists as the Assistant Secretary General, where Lim Chin Siong himself was the Secretary General. He's also a founder of Unity Malaysia. Uh, Youth Kimalaya Socialist Club and was a part of FAJA, the club's journal's editorial board. And uh, I, among the readings that I've gathered, it informs that Dr. Kosuka has resigned from his post as medical officer in the government hospital and turned down a scholarship to continue his medical studies in Britain when he joined Parisan Socialists in the year 1961. Right? And uh, later he was arrested and detained without trial twice alongside prominent leftists like uh, Said Zahari and Lim Chin Chong himself between the period of 1963 and 1972 under the Operation Cold Store and later again in 1976 to 1982 under ISA. So in total, he spent around 17 years in detention. Right. Uh, on the other hand, we have Dr. P.J. Tham, right? Uh, he's a vocal and rebellious historian, if I may say, right? He's currently the managing director of New Network director of Project Southeast Asia, as well as a research, a research associate at the Center uh, for Global, Unit, Global History at the University of Oxford. Right? He's well known to provide historical narratives against the tides uh, that were systematically marginalized or dissolved from the official narratives. Right? In example, he has refuted the claims that PAP uh, did not have the tradition of backstabbing the mentors. Right. He has openly revealed and criticized the concentration of power in the hands of Lee, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, right? So, uh, so pretty much that explains about our panelists today, right? Uh, so let us begin the session with an introductory note by our PSM National Chairperson, Dr. Jay Kumar. Right. Welcome, Dr. Thank you, Bharati. Um, to all listeners, uh, welcome to our, our discussion on uh, Saudra Lin Chin Siong. We have the privilege to have two very uh, experienced people here. Dr. Po Sukai was a contemporary of Lin Siong and we went through a lot of uh, struggles together with him. And uh, Dr. PJ Tham, his academician, who has done a lot of research studies on the whole period of Singapore's independence. Actually, for the PSM, 
issues like this are not really uh, interesting footnotes of history you know for us we think these are still living uh, realistic alternatives if you look back at the history of our nation and the history of the whole of asia and africa uh, when these regions got uh, freedom from their colonial masters there were different views of how to take these countries forward uh, do we stay wedded to the same economic system uh, follow a form of capitalism uh, where the profit motive rules supreme or do we go for something different based on solidarity and in those periods in the 50s and the early 60s there were a lot of people who thought like how uh, sadar lim chin siong and dr po sukai thought i mean he had the bandung conference for example he had sukarno he had nehru he had nasser he had kuma from africa and they all thought of a project which delinked these colonies and um, and uh, focused on using the wealth of these colonies to help their own people more than allow the uh, con- continued exploitation you know of the surplus you see um unfortunately things work out differently in malaysia and we follow the other path but the option put forward then by the bandung group by people like uh, lim chin siong is still something we have to now take a look at because after six decades in malaysia we are still so driven by racial discrimination we are stuck in what they call middle income trap which actually is linked to the key aspect of a growth growth strategy we have been getting businessmen to come here to invest because we are a low cost production and that has become an impediment to us in raising wages or in distributing wealth equitably so the so the issue of how do we develop how do we use the wealth of our country for the people of this country how do we build harmony those issues are the same issues you know 60 years down the line that jim siong and the other people in the barisan socialists even the larger asia and african region were looking at so we look at this whole discussion not as something academic you know that something is a footnote it's interesting let's take a look at it but i think we can get some ideas i mean things have changed 60 years things have changed a lot the world has got much more integrated and all that but still there are ideas and definitely there are inspirations we can take back from how you know people in that generation fought for a society based on solidarity on sharing the wealth and with that with that, that kind of approach that we we take on a discussion like this so i hope you all have a good uh, 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 discussion and you 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 come in with questions and uh, yeah i won't take any more time thank you and thank you to both the panelists for taking time to be with us uh, let's have an interesting evening thank you all right thank you so much dr kumar all right i'll just like to remind mm. that uh, the viewers can pose in their questions comments right if you have any that we'll try to address uh, along the line Right. So without further ado, let us welcome uh, Dr. Poo Sukai to deliver his speech. Dr. Poo Sukai? I start? Yes, get. I start. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Remembering Lim Chin Siong and the socialist wave of the 1950s and 1960s in Singapore and Malaya the socialist wave of the 1950s and 1960s led by Lim Chin Siong and others in Singapore and in Malaya deka and democracy we the left wing socialists decided to take and adhere to the constitutional path we were defeated when the british colonial government played on communal lines and they found successors who continued in that legacy in both singapore and malaysia today we the citizens are still marked by our race 
this real racialization was rejected by the anti-colonialists of the immediate post-war period who formed the Malayan Democratic Union on 21st December 1945. Its members fought for a nationalism that did away with racial categories. It was the first political party formed after World War II to take this stance. The Malayan Democratic Union, or the MDU, stood for unity of Malaya and Singapore, and its reference point was the People's Constitution of September 1947 that it drafted. This People's Constitution was accepted by a joint nationalist movement of Malaya. Malays and non-Malays under the umbrella of Putera AMCJA. The enigmatic, but now largely forgotten, A. Samad Ismail was instrumental in forging this historic unity between the nationalist Malays and the nationalist non-Malays. Not an easy task in the prevailing atmosphere of that era, where British practiced a racist policy of divide and rule. A. Samar Ismail was the, in the Malayan Democratic Union. In that league of the MDU were no less illustrious figures like Lim Ken Chai and William Kok. Samad was also assistant editor of the Utusan Malayu. In his early days, Utusan was a fiercely independent and anti-colonial pro rakyat paper. The paper promoted a democratic and non-racial Malaya, including Singapore, through galvanizing progressive Malay nationalist opinion. To put pressure on the British to accept the people's constitution, the coalition of Putra ACMJA, AMCJA, organized the Pan-Malayan Economic Strike of 20th October 1947, known as Hatal. By the way, Hatal is not Malay. Hatal is from Hindustani. It was a show of historical and peaceful unity of all races of Malaya and Singapore. But the British disregarded the People's Constitution and the Hatal strike. They <clears throat> succeeded in breaking up this unity with the formation of AMNO, a race-based party and declaring emergency rule. Indeed, Communalism was and remains our actually heel, our weakest point. So, when on February the 21st, 1953, Dr. Amraja Kumar and other friends and I formed the Socialist Club of the University of Malaya, then located in Singapore, we recognized the reality that our people were split along communal lines, a reality we continue having to face head on today. Hence, the memorandum of the Socialist Club founding, published in March 1953, 
did not did not deal with socialism but focus on communalism as a hindrance to nation building our hope was that the working class the poor the oppressed the insecure and the precarious groups would unite for their salvation realizing that this salvation can only come about with the formation of a democratic non communal state and nation and we found an ally in lim chin seo the undisputed leader of the left wing labor union movement in singapore incredible as it may be to those used to smear that the chinese speaking left were chauvinists chin song forged very close ties with said zahari osman awang mohammed ahmad mustaman and mohammed ishaq to name the more prominent political leaders Samad Ismail, Osman Awang, Said Zahari, and Said Hussein Ali all wrote tributes to Chin Xiong in the comet in our sky, Lim Chin Xiong in history, which Tan Jing Kui and S Jomo edited in two zero zero one. like the mdu jin song and his comrades readily accepted malay as singapore's national language the largely chinese majority left wing unions ran malay classes with fervor as the commitment to a merdeka nation students and workers attended national language classes Chin Song himself studiously studied and mastered the language. Said Hussein Ali recalled that Chin Song proved himself to be proficient not only in spoken Malay but he wrote articles in Malay too. No less an authority than the poet Osman Awang valued Chin Song for his and i quote great and very significant contribution towards the malays and the malay language osman continued lim chin xiong and his chinese educated friends in singapore had passed a resolution to make malay the lingua franca the national language and common language of communication among the multi ethnic communities in malaya at a time when even the malays themselves particularly the elite government officials had no confidence in the malay language that is osman awa samad ismail said that lim chin song assured the malay population in singapore that with respect to self rule he would propose to the british government that whichever party that comes into power in singapore should be duty bound to promote the political economic and cultural interests of the malays samad added that chin song support was genuine and not a political expedient and that chin song had always shown deep concerns for malay problems in singapore and the federation some had observed too that chin song showed genuine interest in the struggle to promote modern malay literature and to preserve malay traditions and culture He made close friends with Malay writers in Singapore, especially leaders of Asas Nimapulu, 
and Malay cultural movements in Singapore. During Lim Jin Xiong's time, Malay and Chinese cultural activists jointly launched a campaign against the influence of yellow culture or Kebudayaan Kuning. At the same time, the left was principal and also pushed for promoting education in non-English medium schools, in vernacular schools, in mother tongues, which were neglected under colonial rule. Early Nanyang University graduates like Lim Huan Boon, Yang Kui Yi, and his wife Chen Miao Shua are prominent scholars of the Malay language, producing bilingual dictionaries and traditions of Malay texts to Chinese into Chinese, including the first Malay novel into Chinese. Rather than chauvinistic, these Chinese speakers regarded acquiring proficiency in the national language as testimony of their commitment to a new Madeka society, one which reject race as the organizing principle of society. Lim Chin Song was firmly committed to working for solidarity across racial lines. The Udusan Malayu strike broke out on 21st July 1961 in Kuala Lumpur on the issue of editorial freedom and independence from interference by the Tunku and Amno. It was led by the then editor Said Zahari. The mainly Chinese labor unions under Chin Xiong organized to support the striking Udusan workers who ranged from office boys and clerical staff to journalists and editors. Chin Xiong's unions collected donations from the striking, for the striking Udusan workers in a massive show of solidarity and unity. Said recollected that on one occasion, Jin Song accompanied him to a visit on a visit to families of Udusan Malayu strikers in the Singapore office. He chatted with them in good Malay. Said Zahari and Chin Xiong were in total agreement that there would be no racial conflicts between the Chinese and Malays in Malaya without the provocation and intervention of colonialists who thrived when the people were divided. For then, the for then they could be easily ruled and exploited. <clears throat> Said also recalled that in 1961, Raja Ratnam told him that Jin Song was a Chinese chauvinist. But Said stood by Jin Song in the fight for the genuinely united, democratic, independent Malaya, even though he knew that it was going to cause him to be branded as a communist. These are very significant steps in nation building during the socialist wave of the 1950s and 60s in Singapore led by Lim Jin Xiong. The socialist wave of the 50s and 60s was a mighty wave. The British themselves admitted on record that the left wing was the strongest political force at the time. This was reflected in Philip Moore acting High Commissioner's advice to Lee Kuan Yew. 
when Lee said that it was time for him to break with the left in the PEP around July 1961. <coughs> Moore, Philip Moore said, I quote him, the British had always been very chary about advising him to break with what was probably the strongest political force in Singapore. Foreign Office, Record Paper 1091-104. Moore was carefully putting on record that this was Lee's decision to take this risky step, even though it was a move that the British had, in fact, been hoping and scheming for. Lord Selkirk, Lord Selkirk, the UK High Commissioner to Singapore, accordingly engineered for Lee Kuan Yew to kick out the progressive left-wing force within the PAP. <clears throat> it was the force that founded the PAP together with Lee in November 1954. Unknown to us, Lee had been a crypto pro-colonialist from the very early days on in his political career. At that crucial injunction in history, the British colonial government was faced with the left-wing strong demand for Merdeka, the release of political detainees, the abolition of the PPSO, now the equivalent of the Internal Security Act, and more favorable trade union laws for workers in, to organize. Moreover, on the ground, the British surrogate Lee Kuan Yew was being unmasked and the PAP defeated in election, in by-election after by-election. Hong Lim in April 1961 and Ensign followed closely in July 1961. This development forced the hand of the British. To bail Lee out of having to face the possibility of defeat in another by election and in a general election in 1963. Sarkar activated the merger plan for Malaya and Singapore. However, the Tunku was lukewarm about merger with a pro-left-wing Chinese majority Singapore. The British had to work on Tun Razak to persuade the Tunku to accept Malaysia with Sabah and Sarawak thrown in as sweeteners. We in Singapore, we the Singapore left, made it very clear that we did not oppose merger. We did not oppose merger. We were following the people's constitution. But Lee Kuan Yew and his group persisted on maintaining that we were against merger and the mainstream media echoed them. Unification with the mainland was a dearly cherished aim of the people on both sides of the causeway. <clears throat> However, the terms of merger give second class citizenship to the people of Singapore. Lee accepted that in a sellout for his own political survival. Once Malaysia was formed, Lee Kuan Yew's ambition was to replace the MCA's Tan Siu Sin in a racial alliance 
with Amno. However, the Tunku rejected him. Lee Kuan Yew then took out the toxic card of championing the Chinese against Malays in Malaysia. This evil scheme was cleverly disguised under the righteous banner of Malaysian Malaysia. Lee Kuan Yew dangerously kicked the hot button issue of racial discord up several notches in Malaysia. Among many other unsavory characters who resorted to the racial card. Indeed, the communal issue is our actually's heel. The Socialist Front in Malaya, as we know, did not fall for Lee Kuan Yew's gambit of Malaysian Malaysia. They rejected his attempt to court them. In conclusion, I would be amiss if I leave out the geopolitical landscape of the era. It was after the Second World War when people and nations were demanding freedom from colonial exploitation, an era when the existing colonial powers were scrambling to install surrogates to protect their interests. The British view of Singapore's turbulent politics was now dominated by the imperatives of the Cold War. <clears throat> Therefore, at all cost, the British must maintain their military base in Singapore from where they flew Canberra bombers laden with atomic bombs aimed at a China liberated in 1949. The military base in Singapore was also aimed at Indonesia's Sukarno, whose feet the British wanted to, I quote, hold to the fire. There was an understanding and a pact between the old colonial power, Britain, and the new imperial power, America, to cooperate in the region in the Cold War that they had ignited. The socialist wave of the 50s and 60s, led by Lim Chin Siong, created what the British call, I quote, a sea of hostile population against the military base in Singapore, which had to be protected by all means in this Cold War landscape. Hence, the scheme of Malaysia merger to save Lee Kuan Yew. Hence, Operation Cold Store of 2nd February 1963 to cripple the left wing in Singapore. Likewise, in Indonesia, its progressives and revolutionaries were massacred by the millions in 1965, dictated by Cold War imperatives. Yet, in this dismal, seemingly inescapable geopolitical landscape, Vietnam defied the odds and defeated the French and the Americans in 1975. Perhaps they had southern China to retreat into, but a foremost factor contributing to its victory is that Vietnam was already a nation, not affected by communal lines that the enemy can exploit. <clears throat> Our hope lies in the youth of today to leave behind communal politics and build a better tomorrow for all working people. 
the poor and oppressed, the insecure and the precarious. Thank you, PSM, for organizing this talk. Let me then end this inspirational eulogy of Us Osman Awang to Lim Chin Xiong. Perhaps Siva can recite it for me. Hi. Would you like to recite it, Dr. Po? No, no, no. I, I'm a poor orator, not like Lim Chin Xiong. All right. So, yeah. uh, okay, I'll, I'll read it on behalf of you. All right, no problem. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Po. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the poem so that the, that's Osman been, Awang wrote. Yes, written by Osman Awang to Lim Chin Siong. Right. Uh, yeah. It sounds, Saudara Lim Chin Siong, beristirahatlah dalam persemadian yang aman dan damai. Pinjamkan semangatmu, pinjamkan apimu untuk generasi hari ini dan keturunan akan datang demi masyarakat yang adil dan dunia yang cemerlang. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Po. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, uh, in general, Dr. Po has relayed a holistic overview on the progression of the left and the socialist wave in the particular era of 50s and 60s. All right. So, therefore, it suffice to say that the communal politics, right, or the race and religion based policy re, uh, politics remain a, a hurdle even today, right, or even worse. Uh, I believe Dr. PJ has uh, something to delve in this uh, particular issue, right? So let's welcome Dr. PJ. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is PJ Thumb. Uh, I'm wearing a blue and white body shirt, and I'm standing in front of a banner that reads New Narrative, and my pronouns are he, him. Uh, thank you to Party Socialist Malaysia for inviting me to speak to all of you today and uh, thank you to Dr. Jakuma for the introduction and thank you Dr. Po for your speech. It's great to be here today with one of the heroes of our anti-colonial past. So what I wanted to talk to all of you today about is the socialist wave in Malay in the 1950s and 60s and rather than talk about all the things Chin Xiong was good at, which I think uh, can, it has been covered in my work and in all the tributes. I actually want to follow up on uh, what Dr. Po talked about and talk about probably his greatest failure. Uh, and also what Dr. Jaikuma talked about, why it's relevant today, right? Because um, it's, it's not just the fact that the challenge that Chin Xiong failed at, that the socialists failed at in the 50s remains relevant today, but also because we live in a world where socialism is returning to widespread uh, acceptability, right? It, it not so much relevance, it was always relevant, but it became marginalized for a long time. And I think um, socialism is becoming very relevant again today. Because today we live in a world where inequality is higher than ever in human history, ever in all of our thousands of years of human history. In 2019, Oxfam said uh, 26 people control half the wealth in the world. And uh, Inc. magazine recently suggested that number could be as few as eight men controlling half the wealth of the world today. So inequality is at an all time historic high. We live in a world where the three major ideologies that have governed our world over the past few decades are breaking down. Right. Um, we have uh, neoliberal capitalism and its failures that have created all this equality. We have illiberal democracy and we have nationalism, which specifically in the nation state uh, sort of uh, as its political expression. And the time has come for us to reform all of these three ideologies in order to build a better world. And socialism has a great world, uh, role to play in this. So what role can socialists play in this world and more specifically in Malaysia or Malaya? And to answer this, I think it's instructive to look at the last time that Malayans faced a very similar challenge to reform our economic, political and our social cultural lives simultaneously. And that was the 1950s and 60s. 
So how do we build a better world? Well, if the force that led to the exploitation and subjugation of so many people was colonialism uh, back in the 50s and 60s, then for the socialists back then, the answer obviously was anti-colonialism. A better world had to start with ridding our world of colonialism. But what exactly does that mean? For many in Malaya, like Chin Seong, the Bandung Declaration was very formative, and in particular, the language of self-determination. It gave them a new framework, a new vocabulary uh, to deal with this issue. Self-determination for all. But what does self-determination mean? And here is where things get complicated and where we ran into certain uh, contradictions which never were resolved. So obviously at the most conservative end of the spectrum, when you talk about self-determination, right, it just means you transfer power from the British to Malayans, but you don't change anything else, not how the government is structured, not how the economy is run, not how societies are organized. And even at the, pe the people at the top could think the same way. They could be British, uh, educated locals who think like British, identify like British, only the color of the skin changes, right? Everything else stays the same. But most people in Malaya wanted a lot more change for obvious reasons. There was a lot more discrimination the further you went down the ladder. And the question for most Malayans was change to what degree? What do we want to change? Our political structure, our economic structure, our social structure? And this is where socialists um, made very important interventions into Malaya from the war, from you know, the end of the Japanese occupation into the British reoccupation. You see, post-war socialism emerged into a world where the ability of the human mind uh, to rationally overcome nature and build a better world seemed limitless. The 1950s was a time where antibiotics became widespread, when nuclear power became commercialized, when birth control became available, when we went to space for the first time. And if we could do all these things, and if we could also almost destroy the world in World War II, well, why can't we use our minds to build a better world, right? If we just get together, then we can rise above our frail human nature to build a better world for everyone. And that's, to me, the fundamental essence of socialism, collective action in pursuit of a better society. So what is the most important problem facing Malaya? Well, in the very first issue of Fajar, which of course Dr. Poe was one of the founders of, right? It's the newsletter of the Socialist Club of the University of Malaya. The editorial, the front page, identified the two greatest challenges facing Malaya as colonialism and communalism. You can't build a country, a nation, when the people are divided. And not only that, but communalism empowers colonialism because then it allows colonials to divide the people against each other. So the fight for self-determination to build a socialist, a better Malaya started with ending both colonialism and communalism. But if colonialism is pretty obvious, get rid of the colonial power, at least in this that very obvious way, right? Uh, although, of course, there are so many other ways of discrimination and colonialism that you then have to address, but at least there's something obvious of colonialism. But how do you get rid of communalism? How do you create a socialist Malaya with both political and economic, and also, of course, social cultural self-determination? And so for this to be achieved, what the socialists propose is that we need class solidarity, right? And of the greatest importance was the natural alliance between the Chinese urban working poor, the coolies, and the Malay rural laborers. So writings by Malayan socialist intellectuals in this period really emphasize this point. There's all this analysis about the social and economic conditions of both groups, emphasizing the common exploitation of both poor Malays and poor Chinese by colonial capital. And yet, they also recognize the challenge 
the Chinese working poor may, may understand, right, because they are right there in the cities, they see the Europeans, they understand they're being exploited by European capital. But to the Malay peasantry, the face of capitalist exploitation was the Chinese trader. The Malay paddy planter was often exploited at the mercy of the village Chinese shopkeeper who acted as his financier. The Chinese shopkeeper was usually almost always just a middleman, right, for European capital and uh, was very low down on, on the capitalist chain. But to the Malay laborer, the face of his or her exploitation was Chinese. And this was a fact emphasized by Malay politicians aiming to drive a wedge between uh, the uh, poor Chinese and poor Malays. So to this end, socialist intellectuals worked really hard to try and overcome this division. And indeed, James Putucheri uh, wrote his groundbreaking analysis, Ownership and Control in the Malayan Economy, which demonstrated that it was European capital that continued to control Malaya's economy and not as popularly assumed, popularly assumed the Chinese trading class, right? He actually published an early draft in Faja, and then the book came out in 1960. So it was foreign owned clearing houses which controlled the wealth and the structure of the Malayan economy and blaming Chinese, the Chinese capital, uh, sorry, the Chinese petty bourgeoisie, the traders, right, for exploiting Malays was misguided. And then by dividing Malaya communally, it reinforced European colonialism. As such, in order to uproot colonialism, and create economic self-determination, what socialists have to, had to do, Malayan socialists, had to focus not on communal lines, but on the division between colonial power and the dependent colony, or between colonial capitalism, the domestic bourgeoisie, and the workers. But overturning this deeply entrenched political, social, and economic order naturally faced massive resistance from the colonial and Malay establishment. And the Malayan emergency is one manifestation of how the colonial order sought to protect itself from uh, deep reforms to society. And so socialists really struggled in the face of this. By 1950s, socialist discourse had shifted from, yes, class solidarity is inevitable to a much more uh, sober and pessimistic view of the situation. There's a lengthy analysis in Faja by uh, Lim Kian Siu, right, Kian Chai's brother, uh, in Faja, which laid out all the challenges facing the development of class solidarity, including the deep fears on all sides, which were exploited by the feudal, the colonial, and the anti-socialist elements. And this included culture, language, religion, as deep divisions, which the socialists really struggled to overcome. So even a simple suggestion, right? Let's all speak Malay as uh, it's our national language. Let's all speak the national language, which is Malay, so that the whole country speaks the same language. Because you can't have a country where people all speak different languages. So you've got to have one language. What is it? Well, it's got to be the national language, Malay. Simple, right? But that led to a lot of fears in this period from Chinese and English speakers of discrimination against them. And it's true today, right? Language. Uh, is is uh, leads to a lot of fears of discrimination. What language you choose, what language you enforce. Yet you can't have a united Malayan nation without developing a unity between the peasantry and the proletariat, right? So what uh, Kinsey wrote was, to walk, we must use both feet. And yet the feet in this scenario were being divided and going in different directions. So privately, leading socialist intellectuals were really despairing, you know, despairing of resolving this, this contradiction. People were really attached to their ethnic identities. And how do you overcome that and build class consciousness? And that also, when you follow the, the logic of uh, class solidarity, right, led to a lot of difficult issues which socialists were never able to resolve in particular, that logically, the only way to achieve true national unity and class consciousness is to struggle against all capitalists. But that means you also struggle against Chinese capitalists. 
you struggle against Indian capitalists. And when the, you know, and in particular, of course, a lot of this capital is the capital that exploits poor Malays directly. But the problem is your left-wing movement is also heavily reliant on an alliance with the Chinese and Indian communities um, to build a national unifying force. And it is Chinese capitalists who fund the Chinese educational and cultural movement, right? Who seek to preserve self-determination for the Chinese culture and language within Malaya. So if you struggle against Chinese capitalists, you end up dividing your own movement. And this suggestion, James Puducherry actually never voiced it out loud, only in private, you know, uh, talks, discussions, uh, because it's just too radical to propose. Either if you stay true to your principles, you have to split your coalition at a point where the colonial government is already dividing you so heavily against yourself, and you split yourself from a very crucial part of your coalition. So, if you need anti-colonial unity, you have to. Well, what do you do, really? Right. So how to eventually overcome group loyalties and forge a unified Malayan identity? And this ended up being the most crucial dividing line between the Malayan left, between the Malayan socialists, because it touched very much on the meaning of self-determination itself. So for socialist leaders who had uh, experienced a lifetime of discrimination, right, based on race, based on language, based on class, Self-determination lay in strong protections against discrimination, which allowed individuals or individual groups to flourish underneath an overarching Malayan framework with a common language of Malay, with a common Malayan culture, evolving our shared experience and understanding. And it was Chin, Chin Siong who really articulated this sort of very civic-based nationalism he drew upon the experience of Afro-Asia and he argued that uh, a shared anti-colonial structure uh, struggle would not only drive the British out, but this experience of struggle could itself form the basis of a national identity, a new Malayan nationalism by creating solidarity between the different racial, linguistic and even class groups as they work together to negotiate their difference in face of a common enemy in the way that, say, you have a certain civic nationalism evolving out of American, uh, the American Revolution, uh, which allowed them to articulate identity distinct from their previous British identity, right? But others were very much afraid of the disruptions of a prolonged and potentially very radical anti-colonial struggle, especially those who were already at the top of the, the local elite and they argued for a more state, statist approach with a common Malayan identity shaped or even imposed from the top down. And so this is the perspective, the position of Lee Kuan Yew and his group uh, that you need to actually impose an identity on everyone, right? So the creation of a Ministry of Culture in Singapore led by S. Raja Ratnam was precisely to forge a new Malayan culture which would overcome communal divides, but one that was led by the state. But imposing culture undermined self-determination. And this approach was criticized, very rightly so, for its elitism and its perpetuation of colonialism in the sense that in its top-down approach and also drawing upon colonial forms of culture as part of the basis for Malayan culture, right? It was not lost on people that Lee Kuan Yew and his group were all English educated, British educated. So disagreeing with both of them, of course, was the, for those such as Amno, right, who argued for assimilation to a national culture, which was based on Malay culture, that will lead to national unity, that will lead to a national identity, right? Everyone who was not Malay should assimilate and become Malay. That's their basic argument. And that is how we will build a new nation. So this sacrifices equality and self-determination for all the non-Malays in the present, for a potential realization of national unity in the future. But on top of these three positions, some leaders of the Malayan left, right, Malayan socialists also argued that focusing on race and language issues like 
uh, vernacular education, right? Like the rights of minority groups to have their own language education, language culture, would only serve to exacerbate differences between the race and linguistic groups and would instead prevent the formation of Malayan nationalism. So these were fears shared in particular by the non-Chinese, non-Malay socialists, Malayan socialists, including Devon Nair, S. Woodhull, and James Putucheri, who as Indians obviously feared the dominance of the Chinese or the Malays in the future Malaya. So Puducheri argued that, and I quote here, cultural autonomy, meaning that diverse communities should be allowed to maintain and perpetuate cultural and linguistic differences, is pernicious because it seeks to perpetuate communal fragmentation of a country. He argued, he, he said he, it is pernicious because it seeks to perpetuate communal loyalties and communal politics. And he argued that mobilizing people around self-determination for cultural and linguistic issues was well-intentioned, but would actually exacerbate communal antagonism. And one major example of this at the time was Nanyang University, Nanta, which taught a Malaya-centric curriculum in Chinese with the goal of decolonizing university education while protecting the rights of the Chinese to vernacular education. So even if we assume this approach worked, right, which is not proven, the crux of the issue is, does doing this help to build a shared Malayan consciousness by creating graduates who are Malayan in their loyalty and outlook, or increase divisions by creating Malayans who continue to live primarily in Chinese and speak Chinese and live separately from those who don't speak, speak Chinese, right? And this is an impossible question to answer. So even between the three candidates, Devin Nye, S. Woodhull, James Puducherry, they agree on the problem. They couldn't even agree on the solution. Devin Nye will ultimately side with Lee Kuan Yew and his vision. Woodhull would stay with the Barisan Socialists, while James Puducherry would try and remain neutral between the two camps to try and bridge the differences, although shading towards the Barisan. And Puducherry actually argues for the power of capitalism to destroy and he said, let's use the power of capitalism to destroy all communal identities, old nationalisms to remix society and create a new Malayan identity. And these actually, ideas actually gained currency in the 80s uh, in Mahathir's Malaysia in Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore. But ultimately, even James Puducherry would be very disappointed because they would use the power of capitalism, Mahathir and Lee Kuan Yew, to remix society, but also preserve and even emphasize ethnic differences for political purposes. So you see the difficulty of socialists in approaching the national question. If you struggle for the rights of individuals or subgroups, you undermine the unity of the group as a whole. If you struggle for and seek to impose unity on the group as a whole, you undermine the self-determination and rights of the individuals or the subgroups. If you wait for unity to evolve through self-determination, through a shared experience, right? Well, who knows whether that'll happen or how long it'll take. So there was never any clear position, socialist position on the nationalist question. The priorities of ending colonialism and communalism remained clear, but there was no consensus on how this could be achieved. And this remains unfortunately true today. And that's why it's still relevant today to think about uh, communalism, about ethnic nationalism as the, the main stumbling block for socialism, right? It's the chief challenge for socialism around the world. Communalism undermines class solidarity everywhere. Despite inequality, historic inequality, capitalist exploitation, highest ever, and that's not an exaggeration, autocrats and dictators are still using communalism to manipulate ethnic nationalism, to turn people of the same class against each other. And it's very hard for socialists to address. The fundamental rationality of socialism is its greatest strength, but also arguably the greatest weakness, right? Because studies have shown humans aren't rational beings. We're, we're human. People identify with tribes. They instinctively categorize. That's how our, our lizard brain works. So how to overcome this? So I'm not going to propose uh, an answer, right? Far better minds than me have addressed the national question from Rosen Luxemburg to, to Lenin. Uh, I'm almost out of time, I see. So what I'm just going to do is make one observation, if, if you can indulge me, which is the, how the situation today is different from the 1950s. And that is that we live in a far more globalized world. 
the Malayan wave of the 1950s and 60s saw themselves as Malayans first and foremost. Now, they didn't have a lot of choice about this, but they also genuinely did see themselves as Malayan. But we today, right, unlike back then, we can transcend the nation state. We can act across artificial, colonially imposed national borders. And we can conceptualize a globalized world. The generation that's coming of age today is the first generation who have only ever experienced a globalized world. You're a gen they're a generation who were bred from the beginning because of the internet to imagine the world on a global scale. And right now, we have an event that is affecting every single person in the world at the same time. And capital already knows this. Capital just moves across borders like nobody's business, looking for where it can exploit people to maximize its profitability. But labor can't move across borders, right? And that's been the weakness since the 70s. And the, but the thing is, because of this visualization, this imagination of a globalized world, labor for the first time can actually start to work together across borders in ways that we could never have imagined before. So I think the challenge today for socialists is to break free of the nation state paradigm and ask ourselves how we can operate on a scale that includes uh, all humans, right? Nation state nationalism as manipulated by autocrats and dictators remains one of the last permitted legitimate forms of discrimination, but it's something that's ultimately irrational, something that socialism struggles with. But if we can transcend that, maybe that's a pathway forward. And uh, so I, I think I'm out of time. So I'm just gonna end with a quote from Chin Xiong about this, which is in from December 1962, after the Brunei Rebellion, where the Barisan issued a support, uh, a statement supporting the Brunei Rebellion. And they had done so, they had issued these statements a lot in the past in support of anti-colonialism in you know, Aden, Cyprus, Algeria, Congo, West Papua, West Africa, you know. So Brunei was no different. But Chin Xiong was not stupid. He knew that at this critical point in time, if he issued a statement in support of the Brunei Rebellion, I'm sure he knew that the colonial government would have used it against him, right? Use it as a pretext to arrest him, suppress the Barisan socialists. But there was a bigger principle at stake. In order to be truly socialist, we cannot be nationalist. Chin Xiong said, it is our duty not only to fight against colonialism locally, but also to support wholeheartedly the struggle against colonialism that is being waged in other regions. If we're not internationalists, then we would rightly be called chauvinists. We recognize that colonialism and imperialism respect no national boundaries. And the world that we live in today for the first time, right, might actually be possible to achieve this unfulfilled vision of Chin Xiong and our socialist forecast. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for, for tuning in. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. BJ and uh, also Dr. Po Sukai. All right. Uh, I think uh, we have somehow dissected right, uh, and also problematized the issue of uh, nationalism and how the left will deal with the issues of communalism or communal based politics. That is something that is, I mean, as we have said earlier, quite relevant even today. Right. Uh, so before we collect, I think the questions are pouring in as well. But uh, before we address one or two questions from that, uh, we should begin, right? Uh, since we have covered so much, right? So there are many questions as well. Uh, so first of all, Dr. Po Sukai, right? Uh, if you could hear me. Yeah. All right. So uh, I was keen to understand, right? Uh, because uh, during during the uh, merger talks of merger with Singapore and Malaya, right, from into the formation of Malaysia, that you said that the left were reserved on the question of second class citizens, right? What are the terms that uh, you know, like uh, that has been established, or that you perceived uh, to 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 declare or to perceive? This, this terms or conditions, uh, Singaporeans as a second class citizens? Well, <clears throat> firstly is, we were not allowed to discuss the terms. And Kuan Yu was prepared to accept whatever term the Tunku gives. So we were not 
we were second class citizens. Singapore citizens is not the same as a federal citizen. We wanted equality. We wanted to discuss with the Tunku. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for, for like ex for examples, like how how I mean, what are the glaring disparities between uh, Singaporeans and Malaysians, for example? I mean, in the, oh. the top of the mergers. Yeah. You see, the, the Singapore citizens were Malaysian. Uh, like for instance, uh, Singaporean cannot come to Malaysia and stand for election or vote ele in Malaysia. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, may I offer an analogy? Yes, sure. Um, okay. So the merger proposal, right, amounted to a person and their family moving in together in the same house. But the person would only be treated as a member of the family if they're in their own bedroom. The moment they leave the room for the rest of the house, they're essentially treated as a foreigner. In exchange, that person has greater freedom in their own bedroom compared to everyone else in the house. For example, unlike other members of the household, they could run a shop in their bedroom and serve people through the bedroom window. But they would still have to pay for an equal share of all the household bills and utilities and bear responsibility for the whole house. But then when all the people in the household vote on what to do, that person, their vote would only count for two-thirds of a vote compared to everyone else. And meanwhile, the other people in the house would regard that person's motives with suspicion. That, in essence, is a summary of how Singapore was going to be treated in Malaya, Malaysia under Lee Kuan Yew's and the Tunggu's merger proposals. Now, if, you're gonna, if you are that person in that bedroom, right, maybe in, for a couple of weeks, you might be okay with it, but eventually you're going to be really, really frustrated and you're going to want equal rights with everyone else in the house. So that was fundamentally the problem with the merger proposal. All right, all right, okay, okay, that explains, right? So on a, on a lighter hearted question, right? Oh, I just wanted to direct this again at Dr. Po Sukai, right? Who is Lim Ching Siong, right? Beyond the image of a politician or trade unionist or an anti-colonial nationalist leader. Who is Lim Ching Siong? <laughs> Lim Ching Siong is an honest and very friendly person, right? He was born in Singapore, but his early education was in Pontian, in, jo in Johor. He came out to Singapore to do his secondary education. And then with a group of friends, they moved into the trade unions uh, at that time. There, there, there were very many trade unions and uh, the small, small trade unions splintered and they work in three, four unions, sleeping at night on their desks, you know, just to save some money until they could combine them all into one big union. Okay, thank you, yeah. thank you. Right, uh, Dr. PJ, right, uh, so uh, when we, I mean, you have uh, encountered or you have relayed, you conveyed that, you know, the left uh, in, in the 50s or 60s have failed to address the uh, communal issue or, you know, inter-ethnic uh, affiliation or relationship and so on and so forth. But uh, on the other hand, we had, uh, you know, an increasing number of uh, trade union members, right, irrespective of race or religion and so on. So how did they manage, despite of all these conditions of, you know, uh, inequality, communal uh, politics, divide and rule policy? So how did they manage to combine these forces, the working classes? Uh, well, I think part of the answer lies in the fact that people have multiple identities. Um, and when you look at the trade unions and when they were permitted to operate in Singapore and in Malaya, the rest of Malaya, right, they were very effective at winning concessions for uh, their members and they were very effective at uh, winning labor rights. And in particular, in highly urbanized Singapore, they could do that very well. Um, and that's why Singapore actually had more advanced 
uh, labor rights uh, than the mainland. And when they allied with the cultural organizations, um, they were able to help those cultural organizations also win power. So I think there was a, a potential alliance that was actually growing. Um, but unfortunately, because of the overwhelming military strength of the colonial power and their heavy handed use of detention without trial, uh, this um, potential alliance was never allowed to come to fruition. Uh, and and um, Dr. Poe mentioned the anti-yellow culture movement, which was actually a very carefully designed uh, multiracial movement, which had um, the, the whole organization and the movement was divided between languages and different uh, ethnic groups. Uh, and then it resolved itself after the suppression of Operation Photo into a civil rights convention, which was also multiracial. So it's, I don't, I think given time, we could have done it, right? And given time, there could have been, um, you know, as Chin Xiong had hoped, uh, a common identity evolving out of the struggle. Unfortunately, it was basically uh, colonial oppression uh, with local collaborators, uh, the Alliance in the Federation and Labour Front and then the PAP in Singapore, which destroyed this. And then they manipulated ethnic identity in the form of the merger proposals. They manipulated group identity and cemented that in Malaysia. And that set Malaysia off in a very tragic trajectory, which led to separation and then the riots of 69. Right. The, I think the riots of 69, the roots of that lie in how merger was negotiated and then uh, how um, the it was sold to the public and also sold to the alliance. So uh, so I don't I, I think there actually was an opportunity for social uh, socialism um, to overcome those those ethnic uh, identities. But unfortunately, when they met with uh, a deliberate argument designed to exploit ethnic nationalism in the form of Lee Kuan Yew's proposals, uh, socialists were unable to come up with a very coherent response. As long as you, you left this Malayan identity question in the theoretical future, you could concentrate on practical issues like economic uh, issues, overcoming and focusing people's minds away from ethnic issues. So that's why Lee Kuan Yew used merger to kind of um, force people's attention towards ethnic issues which she then manipulated, right? So that's the tragedy of merger in Malaysia. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So in that sense, right, I just have a, you know, extended question, right? So what was uh, independence uh, for, what do you call, uh, Lim Chin Siok or Barisan Socialist itself for the left, uh, you know, in the, in the period of 50s and 60s, I mean, 50s to 60s? What was independence meant for these this stakeholders? I don't okay, so know. So that's a, that's a very interesting. Uh, oh, Dr. Poe, would you like to go first? No, no, I mean, anyone, anyone. Sure. Uh, well, I, I'll always defer to Dr. Poe uh, if he wants to. You could answer that. Yes, please. <sighs> okay. So that's a very interesting no, question. No, no. And okay. Um, okay. Thanks, Dr. Poe. Um, and I think the. As someone who, obviously, I don't know uh, Chin Xiong personally, and I don't have access to his personal writings. So I can only talk about his public position. And his public position uh, was always self-determination and the protection of the rights of individuals and groups, right? And I think that he saw a lot further than most people in understanding that the principles of this and why it was important to hold fast to this, to the importance of anti-discrimination for all peoples, uh, rather than um, the far, a far more rapid and easy way of privileging certain groups in order to uh, more rapidly win independence and more rapidly achieve decolonization. Uh, so he actually was able to apply this principle across a lot of different uh, situations, whether it was the Chinese cultural educational institutions, whether it was labor, right? So for Chinese cultural institutions, he argued of the 
importance of allowing people to speak their own language and be educated in their own language, um, but also speaking a national language and uh, learning a common curriculum that helped build national identity. When it comes to um, the economy, right, he articulated an early form of what today we'd understand uh, Kwame Nkrumah's uh, neocolonialism in that uh, if you don't have economic self-determination, if you don't have local ownership of the economy, if you uh, don't have a government which is locally responsible, formulating economic policy, if uh, the economy remains controlled by foreign business, foreign capital, uh, or if the overall um, governor can veto uh, economic policy or labor policy because they can deem it to be strategic, you know, like a critical um, uh, issue for the British, uh, then it is not real self-determination. So um, it was this principle of self-determination that he was able to apply across to a lot of uh, across a lot of policies, and and that is his public position, right? Um, I can't, as as I mentioned, I'm always very careful to say I don't know what his personal feelings were because, of course, he was a very good politician, uh, and one of the ways he was a very very good politician was his consistency with uh, applying these principles, and his ability to maintain these principles, even as I mentioned, when he knew that it might potentially get him. Uh, arrested, uh, or even conversely, when he gave up very easy political gains, which he could have by going a lot harder on the ethnic issues uh, or getting people in the streets more, but holding fast to a bigger, longer term picture and arguing for nonviolence. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, don't <clears throat> I just want to ask you, right? Uh, I mean, in regarding to independence talks as well, right? Uh, it is said that uh, Lim Chin Siong yeah. held hard positions with the British at the independence talks compared to Lee Kuan Yew. Would you like to elaborate on that, Dr. Po? Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> you mean the first Randall Constitution talks? Yeah. Yeah. The first constitutional talk was held in London. It was led by David Marshall, the mm -hmm. then chief minister of Singapore. The Legislative Assembly had made a recommendation that we asked for internal self-rule. That means you rule Singapore, external affairs is under British, but the uh, PPSO, you know, that uh, it will come under Singapore's control. In London, only Chin Xiong supported Marshall. Lim Yu Hock and Lee Kuan Yew did not. So, so, <clears throat> so the talks failed. And Marshall's idea was he will come back to Singapore, resign, have a new mandate, strengthen this position and go back for the second talk. On the way home, he met Nehru in India and Nehru told him, don't resign. But Marshall being Marshall, when he came back, he resigned. As soon as he resigned, uh, Lim Yu Hock took over and that was the end of Marshall as chief minister. Now, Chin Xiong, when he came back, had a hero's welcome, and the pressure was on Lee. So he became the Assistant Secretary General of the Barisa, of the PAP, and he was scheduled to go to London for the second talk. But the British didn't want him there. Neither did Lim Bu Hock nor Kuan Yu. And so, uh, came, uh, there was a wave of arrests in 1947. There was a wave of arrests, and uh, and and then Lim Bu Hock gave a warning to the Chinese school students who were ca who were uh, camped in Chinese high school. He told them that by 8 a 8 p.m. If they do not leave the school, 
the forces will go in and beat them up. On the same evening, the PAP held a mass rally about half a mile away from the school. And Chin Song was made the last speaker at 7 p.m. That is, the deadline was 8 p.m. Chin Song was the last speaker at 7 p.m. And he spoke in Hokkien, simple Hokkien. My pa mata, don't beat the police. They are wage earners. They are like us. You know? And uh, we, we, sh we should shout Merdeka instead of beat the police. But they wanted to arrest. Lim Bi Ho wants to arrest Lim Chin Siong. And so in the Legislative Assembly the next day, they accused Chin Siong of saying, beat the police. It was a total lie. Beat the police. Lee Kuan Yew in the assembly did not stand up and shout that this is a lie. He kept, he just talked about going to court if it's a, if it's a, if it's a, and not under PPSO. So it was just an excuse because he knew what the government was going to do and he was, a, he was on the stage with Lim Chin Siong, To Chin Chai, Rajaratnam. And they heard in simple Hokkien what Lim Ching Song said. But they kept mum. And they allowed Ching Song to be detained under the PPSO. And then that was the second talk. Now, so the second the second Randall talk in London was therefore between Lim Yu Hock, Lee Kuan Yew, and the colonial office. Now, Lim, <coughs> Lee Kuan Yew proposed to the British that political detainees should not, should lose their political rights and should not be allowed to stand for election. But he talked to Lim Yu Hock and they both agreed. But separately, they both told Lennox Boyd that they want that clause to be included. And that clause was included in the Randall Constitution second talk. And when he came back, Kuan Yew denied it. That's all. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pope. So detainees, so detainees, so detainees were not allowed to stand for election. I see. All right. Uh, just quickly, we have a, we're going to take a question from the uh, FB viewer, right? It's directed to Dr. Poo as well, right? So it reads, uh, we have been talking a lot about internationalism. I wonder if you could uh, tell us more about what that looked like in practice for Barisan Socialists. Uh, what kind of discussions, <coughs> ties, support was there between Malaysian uh, anti-colonialists and socialists and other Afro-Asian peoples? Uh, it was directed to Dr. Po by RDSB. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, we we support we support the Bandung Conference and we support all nations fighting for independence. For instance, <coughs> we have rallies for Lumumba and Fahad Abbas when he came from Indonesia going back to Algeria. We had a rally for him. Okay. The PAP didn't want to have a rally, but the club asked for a rally and the PAP just turned us down and they held the rally. See? But the Barsan Socialists, when they came to office, held a rally for Lumumba. And we support all over. We support Brunei, we support Chetty Jargon, we support uh, uh, the Africans. For the enemies of Vietnam, for the struggle. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor yeah. Bo. All right. I think uh, that answers our, our FP viewer just now. Right. Uh, 
So there's another question for Dr. BJ, right, from Amanda Leone, right? You once said that Sabah and Sarawak was gifted to Tunku by the British. Was there a capitalist interest by the colonial powers? Also, can you comment on it and how to imagine a Malaysia in emerging territorialism, especially in Sabah and Sarawak, where, where very rare anything is discussed involving Sabah and Sarawak? Thanks. All right, Dr. BJ. Um, okay, there's a lot of really good, interesting work uh, being done. Uh, so Dr. Vila Sumaya's work, for example, uh, on, on these issues, uh, I'd encourage uh, everyone to read. Uh, new Narrative also has a new article, uh, a comic that came out a, a short while ago, a couple of months ago, about uh, the Malaysia Agreement in 63 and how it's not been respected. Um, but fundamentally, uh, yes, Sabah and Sarawak were previously judged by the British to be uh, not ready for independence. Uh, but also, of course, Sabah and Sarawak are fun fantastically rich in natural resources. Um, and so the handing of Sabah and Sarawak over to Kuala Lumpur in exchange for them also taking Singapore, basically, uh, was an act of, of neo-colonialism in the sense that uh, Sabah and Sarawak traded one colonial master for another. Uh, but we also have to be careful uh, to understand that the leaders of the um, Borneo parties were went into this understanding that they would never otherwise achieve independence from the British. And the British basically said to them, look, either you go with Malaysia or you'll not get independence for a long time. And when Brunei didn't get independence till the 80s, right? So they drafted the Malaysia Agreement as a way to protect themselves. Um, and they were willing to live up to that, uh, to go into Malaysia on the basis of that agreement. But of course, that agreement uh, was then um, rapidly sidelined and the constitution subsequently changed um, to, to turn Sabah and Sarawak into what they are today, which is de facto colonies of Kuala Lumpur. The same way, say, Papua, you know, West Papua is a colony of Jakarta. So, uh, you know, or, or indeed the uplands of uh, Myanmar is, uh, you know, they don't have their own self-determination. Uh, so uh, this is a very complicated issue, and I think a lot more work needs to be done on it. But yeah, Sabah and Sarawak have had a terrible time with a raw deal, and so much of their national resources have gone to, um, has been extracted by capitalists for exploitation. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. So we'll just take another question from Jeannie Watson, right? So either one, either Dr. PJ or Dr. Po, right? What was the relationship of the socialist wave when leaders like Lin Jin Xiong and Lai to what was going on in mainland China? Right. Either one could answer. Uh, Dr. Po, would you like to? What was? What? Uh, what was the relationship of the socialist wave what and was, leaders? What was what? Can you repeat the question again? Can you, yeah? Can, can you repeat, repeat the question? Yes. What yeah, was can, the yeah. of the socialist wave and leaders like Lim Chin Xiong in Malaya to what was going on in mainland China? <clears throat> mainland China, we... Yep. We we support the government in mainland China. It was the the mainland China is not. I mean the the title of China is People's Republic of China, not a Socialist Republic of China. That should be made clear. So it was it was a mix. It was not a Socialist Republic of China, but a People's Republic of China. And to that extent, it has a lot of overseas Chinese support. Uh, yeah, and if I can add, right, um, yeah. I think it's important to remember several things. The first is that the, um, the leaders of the um, Malayan socialists were born in Malaya. Uh, Chin Xiong was born in Singapore, and to them, China was a foreign country. So their approach to China was very much one of, this is a country which um, 
may not be perfect, but is trying to pursue um, anti-colonialism and purge itself of colonial influence and achieve self-determination. And that is what needs to be respected. Um, and so, uh, and also in particular, if you remember the time you were talking about, right, China appeared to the whole world to have advanced very rapidly from a agricultural, rural, feudal economy and society into a very modern one in the space of a couple of decades, right? The declaration of the People's Republic in 49 was seen around the colonized world as an example of how a formerly oppressed country had stood up and asserted its self-determination. So that's the context in which we view China. Um, and of course, today we look back on that. Uh, what happened afterwards, Mao, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, it was a sense of tragedy. But in the 50s, China was a very shining example of the, uh, to the third world the colonized world of anti-colonialism and self-determination. And that's how they viewed China, right? And uh, likewise, India, likewise, Vietnam, likewise, Indonesia, the Philippines, Myanmar, these were all hugely inspirational to the socialists of Singapore and Malay. Okay, thank you. I think you helped to put it back into the, I mean, put it back in context. Uh, so uh, I have a, a uh, three questions, but it's just combined, right? For both Dr. PJ and uh, Dr. Po, right? So uh, how did Lim Chin Siong and its counterparts in the left coalition seek to correct the unbalanced economic structure in Malaya and Singapore as well, right? Uh, basically, what was the socio-economic and political ideology of Barisan socialists and uh, most importantly, what was the Malayan socialism for Lim Chin Siong? <coughs> Dr. Po? I think his line. Dr. Po, did you hear me? Dr. Po, can you hear me? Oh, <coughs> okay. See, yeah. If when our plan was when we entered Malaysia, when we entered Malaysia, we will we will join work together with the Socialist Front. Yeah, I say we will work close. We will work closely with the Socialist Front. at that time. No? Hello, yeah, yeah, carry on, Dr. Po. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, the other part of the question was, what was uh, Malayan socialism of Lim Chin Siong or for Lim Chin Siong? Maybe Dr. PJ could answer as well. Uh, sure. I, I think it's um, for Chin Siong. Um, what was Malay? Malayan socialism for it Chin Siong. Yeah. Well, there's a big lag here. Uh, well, um, I, I think if, if I can just uh, uh, give an outline. Um, the social, Malayan socialism was, um, from an intellectual perspective, was driven very much forward by... Um, I think the okay. uh, Dr. Yep, we oh dear. Uh, I, I, you're, you're, okay, sorry. Uh, my screen yeah. my screen froze for a second. Um yes. for, for Chin for Chin Xiong as a trade unionist and then later as a, a politician. Um, he was very practically focused. And I think most of his time was actually focused on um, organizing people into, uh, um, into 
organizations in which they could resolve uh, to meet, discuss, resolve difference, and put forward democratic ideas. So Chin Xiong, in some ways, was very process focused, um, and he was very also understanding, I think, of uh, power disparities. And if you look at the things that he said and the things that he talked about, uh, right, he had an understanding of power, I think, that um, might even have rivaled Lee Kuan Yew's sophistication. But he combined that with a great principle that unpacking uh, power, ending discrimination and achieving self-determination uh, self was paramount. Um, and his other great emphasis was on trying to bridge differences and form uh, a common platform of action. So not necessarily unity, national unity in the way that uh, socialists would have liked or class solidarity in the way that socialists definitely were trying to achieve, but rather to try and create common platforms of action in which people could achieve self-determination. Um, and so uh, if you look at the organizations that he created, the trade unions, uh, the cultural organizations that he helped to organize, uh, the student unions, right? It was all very much about trying to build processes that allowed people to voice up, speak out, represent themselves, and then act collectively to win power, uh, or at least to create change. So I, 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 that's how I would characterize it, because unfortunately, we don't otherwise have a lot of intellectual uh, discussions, you know, intellectual writings by Chen Xiong um, that uh, in the way that we have for many of the, the leaders of, of um, the University Socialist Club, right, like, like Puducherry, like uh, the editorials on the front page that Dr. Poe helped write, right, these are, um, we don't really have that sort of source base for Chen Xiong, unfortunately. Um, we can only figure it out from what he did. Yeah, so he's much more practically focused. All right, thank you, thank you. Dr. Po, would you like to say anything? Regarding the Malayan socialism, yeah. You need to unmute your mic. Dr. Po, you need to unmute. Uh, yeah. Cool, cool. Yep. What is it? I need to. Yep. I, I need to what? You can speak now. My. Are you good? No, I have nothing more to add. Okay, okay. I have nothing more. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right. Uh, so, yeah. uh, the next question, right, uh, it's regarding Barisan Socialists, uh, before the formation of Barisan Socialists, right? So, uh, was Lim Chin Xiong deceived by Lee Kuan Yew, purging out the radical left from the PAP to strike a deal with the British and later Tunku in Malaya? Okay. What was Lim, Lim Chin Xiong deceived by Lee Kuan Yew, you know, purging out the radical left from PAP to strike a deal with the British and uh, Tunku in Malaya? <clears throat> uh, Lee Kuan, we were kicked out. Yeah. We were kicked out by the PAP. You see? Circa. Selkirk arranged for a tea party in which he wanted to, to force Kuan Yu's hand to kick us out. So James rang up and accepted the tea party. But on the very day, we were already kicked out. So when James rang up in reply to Selkirk's invitation, Selkirk was saying, well, you can come anytime you like because he has already achieved his purpose. And there was a tea party. Selkirk was planning to force Kuan Yu's hand, but Kuan Yu acted 
before that. He acted and kicked us out on a vote of confidence on merger. And at the same time, he dismissed all the all the political secretaries, but how James Jin Xiong were dismissed. And so we had no, no choice but to form a new party. All right. Okay. Thank you. Dr. PJ, would you like yeah. to end? Uh, well, I mean, deceived is a is a very difficult uh, word. I'm not sure uh, whether we can say he was deceived, um, because the problem is they're operating in an environment where the British have the right to suspend the constitution and arrest everyone uh, at any time, right? And the British were very sensitive about this because Singapore uh, was a vital, vital cog in British strategic interests around the world and um, you know, east of uh, Suez, Singapore was the most important port for the British. Uh, and if you look at examples from uh, elsewhere in the empire, uh, for example, Ghana and the British willingness to suspend the constitution and um, take the hits for it, uh, both politically, internationally to their reputation uh, and also domestically in their efforts to decolonize because they didn't like uh, Nkrumah's government. So uh, they actually, Chin Xiong had to walk a very fine line. And the reason why Lee Kuan Yew had so much latitude was because Kuan Yew shamelessly lobbied the British, especially in the, uh, the first set of constitutional talks where he spent most of the time up in uh, London, rather than attending the meetings of the Singapore delegation, he was meeting with all the British politicians and trying to get himself known and basically shamelessly lobbying all of them to tell them, I'm your collaborator in Singapore. So Chin Xiong was in this position where he didn't have the Cambridge education or legal education of Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, and they, the party recognized that they needed someone like Kuan Yu to navigate forward in a very uncertain, difficult uh, environment. And Kuan Yu used that to his advantage, right? So it's, in a sense, a lot of Kuan Yu's advantage just came because he was born into a wealthier family and had these all these privileges and was able to then, you know, go abroad to study and learn the language of the colonial oppressor. Uh, and that made him invaluable to an anti-colonial movement, which to many leaders of which couldn't, um, weren't, you know, didn't have that language and training that he did, right? So do we, I mean, I think Chin Xiong knew this. So do we say Chin Xiong was deceived? Um, I think Chin Xiong knew that Kuan Yu was uh, a, a very valuable tool to the anti-colonial movement. And ultimately, Chin Xiong believed that you had to forge a um, anti-colonial common united platform of action and kept trying to do so and stay true to his principles rather than um, break with Kuan Yu. So as Dr. Po described, there was Kuan Yu who broke with Chin Xiong. And almost lost the 63 election because of it and the British had to bail him out and the, you know uh, by arresting everyone with cold store. If not, he would have lost the 63 election, no doubt. All right, thank you, thank you so much. All right, so we'll just take another question, right, from Faris Juraimi. Uh, what are some possibilities for recovering and applying the ideology of Malayan socialism as a means to address the inequality and enduring injustices in Singapore and Malaysia today. Is this even possible in post-separation Malaya? I, I don't want can answer. You know, Dr. Jakuma is still in the chat. I think he should also answer because he's actually been at the forefront of this battle in, in parliament for 10 years and all that. 
I, I don't know if he's still here, if he'd like to answer that, because I'd be fascinated to hear his yeah. answer. Yeah. I'm not sure whether he's here as well. I, no, I don't think All so. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. He's not here. He's not here. All right. <laughs> so, so we come back to either Dr. Po or Dr. PJ. Uh, uh, well, um, if I can just uh, offer a few thoughts, I think the first one, as I mentioned earlier, is to try and transcend the nation state. Um, we, we, we have been in a situation in the last 50, 60 years where nation state nationalism has been uh, used very shamelessly to suppress class solidarity. Uh, and to uh, justify and perpetuate inequality and enduring in injustice. Uh, thanks for the question, by the way, by the way, Faris. Good to see you here. And I think um, we need to think again about forging alliances across borders with like-minded uh, people, um, regardless of where they are, and to build solidarity uh, globally. Right, and we're seeing this already around the world. Uh, for example, uh, all those people, all those kids who organized via TikTok to embarrass Trump uh, all around the world, uh, all the Amazon workers, 15 different countries to protest against a single capitalist exploiter, right? So uh, I think one of our challenges is to transcend the nation state, right? And, um, and that is something I think that the socialists in the 50s recognized, the irrationality of the construct of the nation state, you know, and um, how it has been manipulated today by Trump, by Orban, or even by Mahathir, by Muhyiddin, right, to uh, enforce a certain discipline uh, on us. And it only has power as long as we collectively imagine that it exists. So I'd say to get rid of the Malayan from the socialism is to please have socialism. And I think the other thing that uh, Malayan socialism was very um, focused on was interrogating power. And because it operated in a uh, part of the world where there was a huge amount of uh, communalism, it was very sensitive to the national question, uh, to ethnic identity. And part of how it responded was um, the interrogation of power and uh, a focus on self-determination and ending discrimination. And that's, I think, the starting point for us going forward is to really focus on ending discrimination in all its forms um, as a way of uh, addressing inequality and um, you know, um, addressing injustice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Poo, would you like to add anything? The question of Faris. Uh, I, I think he muted his mic. Is he <coughs> Okay, yeah, carry my, on. My mic is okay. It's my voice. My mic is okay. It's my voice. Okay, okay. Would you like to add anything? No. No, nothing. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. All right. I would like to thank uh, both the panelists, right, for your time. We have spent like more than one hour, one hour and 45 minutes, right? And uh, you have shared a lot of insights, right? A lot of critical discussion has been undertaken today, right? Uh, so I hope that today's exchange had been uh, fruitful for everyone, right, including the viewers and so on. Right, so the historical information from the past, right, we should not uh, be a be a mere glorification, you know, just in things that lingers in the past. Rather, a useful lesson of the left today uh, to advance their goal of establishing a just world and so on and so forth. Right, uh, Dr. Kumar, would you like to say anything before we end our session today? Uh, very good. <coughs> Hi, uh, I think a lot of interesting uh, questions and ideas have been uh, expressed. And um, I think the issues of, uh, of poverty, of income distribution, of building a harmonious multiracial society 
we're still very much where we were in the 50s and 60s. We haven't really made that much progress. In fact, in some ways, we've regressed. And we need a, a, a people-centered, secular, socialist movement to bring people together. So I think the things that Chin Xiong and his group were fighting for uh, are still very relevant to us today. The environment is different. And, uh, and, and we need to see how we can uh, um, you know, put those, I mean, reinterpret those, those, those issues in today's time. To see how we can be relevant, how we can get across. And the problem is, you know, a, a lot of Malaysians have been, you know, what, what the term that uh, Hisham Dim Rice uses, you know, bonzified. Huh? Bonz so their, their thinking has become so narrow. On one side, we have Malay nationalism in a very conservative form. On the other side, we have uh, DAP pushing the PAP program of Malaysian Malaysia, which uh, a lot of Malay nationalists cannot accept. So I think if we, the, the, so we have this problem of the thinking itself, the narrative itself of the country, now it's very divided. So we've got to find a unifying narrative that brings together on the basis of uh, social economic uh, interests of the majority of our people and see whether they can afford a program and bring people together. So we've got a big job ahead of us. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Koma. All right, I would like also to express gratitude to Dr. Po Sukai and Dr. P.J. Tam for your time and for your discussion today. All right, and uh, also thank you to our uh, viewers today. All right, so hope we can see in further discussions in another forums and whatever, maybe. All right, thank you. Salam perjuangan. Good night. <laughs>